Payroll Processing Universe and Beyond Clean Nation. It's Hank Balch here with another episode of Beyond Clean Live. We've got a great show queued up for you today. If you're tuning in on YouTube or Facebook, please put in the comment section below where you're watching and tuning in from. The same thing for LinkedIn. We've got a ton of folks that are going to be tuning in from the LinkedIn live feed today. It's going to be a great show on single-use medical devices. We've got a panel of three today, including myself. We're going to run for just under an hour. So if you start tuning in and you realize, oh man, my friend is going to love this conversation. You got plenty of time to give them a text message right now, walk down the hallway and say, hey, pull up your computer, log on to Beyond Clean, see that conversation that's happening right, right now. Um, if you're new to Beyond Clean, this is your first exposure to the conversations that we have in the medical device industry, I want to welcome you. And, it, and if you like this conversation, I want to encourage you to like and follow our social media pages. We're all over social media from Instagram and Twitter to Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And then, of course, we've got a weekly podcast that comes out every Monday through all kinds of podcast apps, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, the whole shebang. It's the Beyond Clean podcast. We've got a new podcast that just started a couple weeks ago called Beyond Clean Gold Mine. that is a daily podcast release on all terms in our industry. So it's a digital dictionary of sterile processing terms. It releases every day, there's a new word and a, and a new definition, go check it out. Now, single use devices, all right? I think you've got an opinion on that and I'm gonna ask for that opinion in just a few moments. But before we do that, let me welcome the panelists to the show. And I'm gonna have them introduce themselves as they hop on. Ryan, you wanna kick us off? Yeah, thanks, Hank. Um, you can hear me okay, I'm assuming. Great, uh, my name is Ryan Blasco. I'm from South Bend, Indiana. I have the opportunity to work with excellent physicians like Dr. Mark Gromsky. I've been in the medical device industry for about 14 years, and I love talking about single-use medical devices and how they impact patient care. Awesome, thanks, Ryan. Welcome to the show. <laughs> And Mark, would you please tell us about yourself? Hi, everyone. Mark Gromsky here. Thanks, Hank, so much for the invitation to this. Really appreciate being a part of it. Uh, I'm assistant professor of medicine at IU Health um, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and I'm a gastroenterologist, and I specialize in the interventional endoscopy. Okay, great. Well, I think between the three of us, we have an interesting conversation here from a lot of different perspectives. And as I promised, I want to start off this feed asking a question uh, to the audience. It's pretty straightforward. Where do you stand on single-use endoscopes? I know this is kind of a broad question. There's some nuances here, but just straightforward. If I ask you on the street today, in your hospital, in your GI department, in your sterile processing department, what is your opinion on single-use medical devices in this category. And if you're tuning in and you're just a patient, you happen to run into this seat and say, hey, I'm about to have one of these procedures. Let me see what they're talking about. Um, from your perspective, what do you think about it? From what you know or maybe what you don't know, do you have an opinion? Please put those comments in the comment section below, and we'll take a look at a few of those here later. Uh, before we get too much further, though, I want to start with you, Ryan, on a question about what is single-use medical devices. So when we throw that word out in the industry, there's a lot of folks you know who may know what that is. But if like with everything else that we mentioned before, there is some nuance there. So can you walk us through what we mean when we say that? Yeah, I mean, a single-use medical device, Hank, is something that's strictly intended for one use on one patient during only one procedure. So these tools uh, should not be reprocessed. Instead, they're properly disposed of immediately after use. That's that's the best way I can describe it. So Mark, in your practice right now, um, 
I'm assuming there's a lot of single use devices or single use supplies that you use. This is not a new uh, concept to the industry, correct? Right. So uh, with with the scopes that I do, almost almost every tool that goes down the channel of an endoscope, you know, just to kind of back up an endoscope is is uh, basically a visualization device that goes somewhere in the body. It's got a camera and a light on it. Um, and traditionally, those had been reprocessed after every use. Um, um, but most of the tools that go through that uh, endoscope or through that device um, are these days single use. They used to be uh, reusable, but these days, most of those devices that we do to, whether it's take off a polyp, whether it's get into a bile duct to relieve a stone or infection, et cetera, most of those tools are all single use these days. So it, it, it's a question for both of y'all, I guess, on those accessories, because you bring up a good point. Those have moved single use much uh, quicker than the actual device itself. Uh, why? Is it a matter of um, cost? Is it a matter of preference for manufacturers or for providers? Like why the accessories go single use? Um, and now, you know, finally we're having this conversation on the device itself. Do you have any insight on that, Ryan? Yeah, I'm happy to go first. Thank you, Hank. And uh, I'm sure Dr. Gromsky has um, some good points as well. So, <laughs> you know, from an industry perspective, it's it's like technology, right? If you wanted to buy a big screen TV 10 years ago, HD, it's like $5,000. I saw a pre-Black Friday sale for a 42 inch 4K TV at Walmart for $88. Okay. I mean, it's amazing, right? So technology had to catch up. But if you look at what reusable scope manufacturers have been doing for a while now is they've slowly been making their reusable scopes disposable. First, you have a disposable biopsy cap, then uh, then you have disposable valves and buttons. So it's slowly becoming a disposable scope anyway. Um, but you brought, you brought up a great point. Everything that's delivered into the patient um, through this scope down the working channel is disposable, single use. But the thing delivering those disposable single-use devices is reusable until now. Finally, technology is caught up um, and, and they're starting to come out with single-use scopes. I think the first single-use scope uh, for the company I work with, Ambu, was in 2009. And so fast forward 11 years, I mean, that's a lot of progress uh, in a very short period of time of single-use. So that's my perspective uh, from an industry person. I'd love to hear what, what Mark has to say. Yeah, I think the um, the tools that we use uh, through the scope tend to be things that get more wear and tear because those are the things that are actually intervening upon um, intervening upon the patient. And any time that you get wear and tear, uh, you have a chance that that thing may break inside a patient's body, that that thing may uh, harbor an infection in a little crack, et cetera. And so um, the combination of uh, minimizing the wear and tear on the actual workhorse tools, uh, I think is one thing that moved us in that direction. And the other thing I think is the ability to quickly uh, iterate and reiterate tools. Because for instance, I do a lot of ERCPs. That's a specialized scope where you go down the mouth and you intervene upon the bile duct, which are the drainage pipes of the liver or the pancreas duct, which is the drainage pipe of the pancreas. And just small little things with a, uh, for instance, a wire or with a, a something to cannulate with, we may recommend changing. And if something is a, uh, a stock item that requires uh, much more to produce so that it can last for 50 or 100 uses, it's much harder to iterate those because that becomes a capital expense. And that's a much bigger outlay for the, for the institution, for instance. And so, um, and so the ability to iter iterate and reiterate small little changes, I think, is also something uh, that has led to a wider variety of options for us um, and also uh, kind of an evolution of these devices quick, more quickly over time. Okay. So we've kind of been uh, assuming that the answer to this next question or by kind of talking around it, you know, but really... Uh, there are some threats to patient safety uh, in the context of the procedures that we're talking about, but really any medical procedure that 
there's potential threat uh, to the health of the patient. You know, there's always risks involved. But in particular to medical devices and reusable medical devices, there are there are certain threats that are out there that are impacting this conversation around single use and reprocess medical devices. I'm wondering if y'all could speak uh, to some of those threats uh, as you see them today and how they're impacting your portion of the industry. And I guess, Mark, if you want to start us off with that one. Yeah, so, um, you know, to kind of get to the point of, um, you know, what what I'm talking about and what I'm interested in are single-use duodenoscopes. That's a small fraction of, of endoscopes in general. You know, endoscopes can be used uh, to go into the bladder, to go into the lungs, to go into the uh, colon, to go into the upper GI tract, etc. cetera. Um, within GI, we've had a lot of um, uh, literature and a lot of uh, activity in the lay press. There was an expose in the New York Times, et cetera, about the specific scopes of the duodenoscopes, um, and those are used uh, not infrequently. You know, we do multiple thousands of them a year at our institution, um, but uh, they're used for the ERCP procedure that I was talking about. And um, uh, there have been a number of outbreaks of infections uh, uh, that have been transmitted linked to duodenoscopes that have been reprocessed. Um, uh, going back five years or more. And so there's been an incredible amount of uh, industry led and also honestly guidance by the federal government agencies, FDA, CDC, et cetera, that we need to do better with our devices. There are a couple peculiarities to that scope where there are nook and, nooks and crannies where even if you uh, reprocess them optimally, you may still have an infection risk. And so that means that even though our, our scope cleaners are doing a great job, there may be something inherent to the device that leads to that risk. And so that's what is, uh, you know, drawing a lot of attention. Um, uh, Ryan has, uh, has a lot of experience with other types of scopes as well, but I, I particularly have a lot of expertise in, in that uh, uh, specific scope that has been linked to a number of uh, uh, infectious outbreaks. Yeah. yeah, what do you think, Ryan? Well, first of all, it was very well said, um, and I knew it would be. So really, he, he brings up some incredible points, right? There's 17.7 million endoscopic procedures performed annually. Of those, uh, duodenoscopy, which Mark's talking about, the ERCP procedure, is around half a million. Okay, so if you have half a million procedures being done, that, that's not small potatoes, right? Well, Studies have shown that 15% of these duodenoscopes, even after high level disinfection, still remain contaminated. So that means 15% of these scopes that are patient ready are still contaminated. Um, does that mean a patient's gonna get infected? Absolutely not. In fact, the infection risk, when you look at it, it's about 1.2%. But you take 1.2% of half a million procedures, you're looking at the potential of 6,000 patients getting infected, right? And so obviously that's unacceptable to industry that's unacceptable to healthcare professionals. So what can we do about that? Um, and, and that's kind of why this conversation started. That's why companies are investing millions of dollars into this technology. And that's why we're trying to partner with people like Mark and like Indiana University that are doing the bulk of the, these procedures. So they can give uh, industry the feedback we need to create tools to help prevent those things uh, that are causing contamination and infection. So. We're well on the way, um, we're just beginning, um, and I'm sure we'll get into it on this talk, but a lot of things have to fall in line. You know, you're not gonna just carte blanche, just switch things overnight, right? There has to be training, there has to be uh, ramp up with these devices. Uh, the good news is, you know, if I told you, Hank, like, hey, you've got an iPhone right now, but I'm switching you to an Android. A lot of things are intuitive. And these physicians are learning new medical devices every year. Like if, Mark, if if I asked you, like, what you know, what devices are you using in 2020 that you used uh, when you first started doing ERCP? I bet they're not the same exact devices, right? So uh, things are constantly evolving, constantly changing, and then we get into the conversation around, okay, when do we start talking about these options with patients? And that's that's really where it's at because everything else in the world 
you have a good, better, best option, right? As consumers, we, we can choose what we want. So when, because patients are educated now. So when do we start saying, hey, patient, here's your option. You have a single use device that's never been used on another patient. That's an option. Here's the upside of that. Here's the downside of that. And here's your other options. So that's that's kind of the exciting part about this conversation. And, and one 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 comment, if, uh, if I may, Hank, uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I, I just couldn't hold this in. You know, um, uh, uh, there have been some associations uh, with incomplete or improper reprocessing uh, linked, but not all of them. And so that tells us that that tells us that part of the problem is that it's a very complex reprocessing set of set of um, instructions to reprocess to duodenoscope. If, if you've ever seen a pamphlet of how to reprocess a reusable duodenoscope, it's really uh, large and it's been a dynamic field because the FDA has recommended um, uh, supplemental steps as well. Um, and, and so, and so one thing that we've found is that there are variability of how the scopes are after they come out, depending on the volume of your center. For instance, if your center just does two ERCPs a month, the people cleaning those scopes, uh, it, it's not their fault, but they don't have the practice like, like an institution where you're doing 15 to 20 a day and you have dedicated scope cleaning personnel that do that all day, every day. And so there is variability in, in how well um, uh, the scopes get cleaned, in my opinion, depending on your volume, depending on how well your, uh, your reprocessing technicians and personnel are doing, depending on what type of surveillance you have and what type of systems you have built in to keep track and to continually train. And so, um, and so um, I, I, I will say that there are a lot, a lot, a lot of variables that go into what risk you may have of a reusable scope. Um, and, and some may argue that any risk is unacceptable. Um, but, uh, you know, some places or some, uh, you know, spots may have higher risk than others. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. Um, I think the perspective of the endo tech, you know, listening to you um, speak, they're saying, amen, you're right. We have a lot of uh, pressure, you know, time related pressure. We have a lot of constraints in, in terms of capital investment in these departments you know they're trying to do too much with too little uh you brought up the comment about the instructions for use and that is a known issue not only in the scope conversation but all these reprocessable medical devices those ifus are um pitiful you know it's a pitiful excuse for what we're um trying to give in terms of real clear repeatable instructions that folks can not only find in the book that you reference, you know, but once they find them, read, comprehend, and then do them consistently. So I, I totally agree, you know, we've been set up to fail from the very beginning when it comes to those instructions. But again, you know, when it comes to investment in, in the equipment, when it comes to investment, in these technicians, for training, not to put everything on the human error piece, but uh, if you've not been trained, if you don't have the equipment, if, it, if the instructions are poorly laid out, you know, what do you expect people to do? Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole phrase like continuing to try the same thing again and again and expect a different result. You know, that is not going to work. Now, to what Brian said previously, because uh, we laid out the threats, we're aware of these threats and the industry at large has been trying to do things to address them. There's been more research from folks like the Corey Ofsted group into the breakdowns for these scopes. We've talked about, you know, do we run them through a high level disinfection process twice? Uh, do we redesign and make more of the accessories um, to these scopes single use? Is that the solution? Do we need better brushes, better cleaning equipment? Uh, do we need to terminally sterilize? So all of those have been put into place and concern and um, 
being discussed and debated in the industry. But I guess the question, you know, that we kind of need to answer and I want to hear your perspective is, have they been working? Have we seen an impact, you know, Mark, from your perspective on in the last five years, all the information that's coming out, you know, CRE, those breakouts came in uh, 2015. So we're about five years out. There's been a lot of activity, a lot of response. Is what we're doing working? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's it's very good timing for this discussion. As as you mentioned, Hank, there's been a lot of research in this uh, in this area. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, myself and my colleague just published uh, on this topic uh, this month in gastrointestinal endoscopy, the number one endoscopic journal. Uh, uh, it's available online. It's not available in print yet um, on this topic. And what we did is we compared uh, reprocessing duodenoscopes with either double high-level disinfection, like you mentioned, running it through twice, doing the manual cleaning twice, or liquid chemical sterilization, which is like the sterus um, uh, thing. And both of those were uh, offered as potential supplemental measures by the FDA back in 2015. And we found that, you know, neither one of those were, were uh, better than the other, but we, we didn't drive the, the, the post surveillance rate. So that means we've done both of those uh, double high level disinfection or liquid chemical sterilization. Then we cultured the scope. Um, we didn't eliminate all of the bugs, uh, although we drove it down pretty low. You know, it was like uh, 2% or so. Um, and so that's kind of, in my mind, best case scenario. That's kind of where the best possible um, options are going to be. Like I said before, it only gets worse from there, um, you know, um, but, but, you know, I think there has to be a discussion. Uh, can we do better than that? Um, and I think that's where we're going to head with this discussion. There are a lot of new uh, generation things coming out, single use scopes um, or single use components on the scopes um, that will hopefully do better than that. Because to be honest with you, we looked in our, uh, in our system, running double high level disinfection, double uh, manual cleaning on average took us 98 minutes per scope uh, to reprocess. And so that means we're very lucky. We've got 40 scopes, 40 duodenoscopes in our fleet. And so we have some, you know, you know, we've, we've got some room to work. Um, but uh, not everybody has that. Not everybody can afford to, if things go perfectly, that's the average, you know, 98 minutes. What happens if you have to run it through the cycle again or there's a leak seal test or whatever happens? You know, Hank, you know the things that can happen, you know, then you're up to two hours and that's just not acceptable, you know. And so I think that I think that we've made innovations in reprocessing. We know that by working on the reprocessing, we can drive it down, but we can't eliminate it. Right. Yeah, I, I, Ryan, this is kind of a softball to you, but has what we've been doing have been working in your opinion? Well, I mean, if it if it was working, then I probably wouldn't have a job, <laughs> <laughs> and my company probably wouldn't exist. Um, more infections and outbreaks have been linked to contaminated endoscopes than to any other medical device. Period, mm -hmm. um, and and that's why we're on a mission to help solve that. And Mark's absolutely right. This isn't something where every hospital is the same. There's so many variables. There are a lot of hospitals that are doing two to five ERCPs a month and their techs cannot follow a hundred plus steps to clean an endoscope. Cause if they do get busy, that they're being pulled in two different directions. This tug of war is, Hey, I want to thoroughly de decontaminate this scope, but I have to be efficient and get this scope back in circulation to treat these patients that are waiting. And that's not fair to the scope tech. That's not fair to the patient. That's not fair to anybody. Um, a recent survey of 2,500 uh, scope techs said that up to 17% of them skip steps because they feel hurried to get the, the scope back in circulation. Um, and 40% of them feel um, like they're under a time crunch at all times, 40%. So imagine being that person, you've already got a very delicate job to do. It's, it's scary, like, hey, if I mess up, patient safety could be at risk. If I mess up, I could get yelled at because I'm not getting the scopes back in circulation in time. That's not an environment you said it, Hank, yourself. You're being set up to fail. And so if we can mitigate those risks, you know, the way we look at it, there's, there's three categories. There's a risk of infection. There's reprocessing issues. 
um, and there's economic and legal factors that you have to look at. And I know we, I think we're about what, halfway through this at this point. Um, we're probably not going to get to all those. Um, <laughs> That's but, all right. We'll go a little quick. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly a lot to discuss here. Um, and and I, I agree with Mark. I love that they're doing that research. The, the issue I think industry is trying to point out is how much more time and money are we going to throw into a process that's proven not to work? In, in a lot of cases, that, that's an expensive investment. These scopes on average cost $30,000 low end up to $60,000 high end. And if you look at the math, it's about $1,400 to $1,800 per procedure to use a reusable duodenoscope. scope. So if you can make a single use scope that's cost effective, that's very efficient, he said 98 minutes. That's a world-class university, Indiana University. They're processing 40 duodenoscopes. It's like assembly line medicine there. They have it figured out. If it takes them 98 minutes, how long is it taking these other hospitals that don't have that, that privilege to, to have that sort of system set up when you could take a single-use device, plug it in, use it on the patient, throw it in the uh, recycling bin, and then grab a new one and start the next case? There is no downtime. So what's the cost, yeah. right? Cost benefit ratio. Well, there's there's an answer to your question that needs to be said, and I'll say it from the yeah. perspective of the endo tech and the sterile yep. processing tech is it won't take 98 minutes. And uh, the place that the time will be shaved is the those steps that are skipped. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, it is it, it seems horrible to say because we are the defenders for patient safety uh, but and you know like i'll say nobody in our industry wakes up in the morning goes to work and says i want to hurt somebody today and if i want to take a shortcut and i want to put someone at risk no one does that but in our jobs you know because a lot of these folks they feel not only the pressure from the scope room and from the provider but they feel it from the manager they feel it from the administrator they feel like that patient is waiting on a scope and there's still a lot of trust in the equipment the automated reprocessing equipment that we have and i would perhaps posit that there's too much trust based on the data so we feel like if we can skip some of the manual steps, you know, not a big deal because that can shave off some of that much needed time. But as long as we get it in the AER, then we're solid. Or as long as we can get it in in the sterilizer, you know, then we're going to be okay. So we can save some steps on the front end and move it through that process. And I'm telling you, I don't want to attack any hardworking scope techs out there who say, I would never do that. But I've been in these departments, we've consulted, we've done joint commission prep surveys. I have seen the steps skipped right in front of me. They know that I'm standing there taking notes. So the time savings is, uh, is one of those invisible kind of metrics where we know if you followed everything, this is how long it's gonna take. But then you start talking to providers and they're like, oh yeah, like my stuff never takes that long. Like they always just get it right back to me. Well, the question is, how are, how are they doing that? And, I, and are they doing so compliantly? And then on this research piece, is the scope that you're getting back so quickly actually clean, disinfected, sterilized, whatever you're doing? Um, as we move on to the patient portion of this conversation, I want to throw out another poll for folks that are tuning in. If you're watching this live, you can answer live. If you're watching this on demand afterwards, I still want to see your answer uh, because this is really one of the central themes for this conversation is should patients be given a choice regarding single use versus reusable medical devices? And in this conversation, we're talking about endoscopes broadly. Um, should patients be given that choice? If you were going into a procedure as an endotech, for instance, who knows all the potential breakdowns or challenges in our industry, if you're going into a procedure at a place that you don't work and you were given the option, what option would you choose? Or if you had a loved one that was going in some place that perhaps you're aware of the challenges in those departments via some headlines, you know, a couple of years ago, maybe they were one of the um, the hospitals that had the breakouts. 
should you be given a choice? That's the question, and we'd love to see your answer in the comment section below. Um, as we walk through this, though, Mark, there is a question about um, education, all right? Uh, do your patients know or even understand this debate in regards to single-use versus reusable medical devices? Are they asking anything about the scope that you're using when you're setting up their procedure? So, um, personally, uh, our, our patients have not been asking a lot about it. Um, I think I've heard from, you know, we speak um, on this topic a lot, and I talk to folks, GI docs uh, around the country about this uh, topic, and it seems like patients know much more about it if they've been in an area that has had a, an outbreak before um, that's been publicized and in the local media, et cetera, um, those folks are much more in tune to this topic. I just wanna um, uh, make a comment though. Uh, the procedure that we're talking about is, is uh, inherently probably the most risky GI procedure that we do. And so there are significant risks to doing this procedure above and beyond infection. Uh, and so, you know, there's a, up to about a 5% risk of pancreatitis, which, uh, you know, can be life-threatening or life-altering, bleeding, perforation, and then infection, of course. And so the, the patient education uh, one is a, is a really tough one, I think, because that's assuming all scopes are created equal. Um, and we don't have the data. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, crystal ball, I think that single use scopes in our field are going to be a, a major, uh, you know, significant uh, change and, and we'll be using them a lot in the future. But what I will say is that we don't have data on, we don't have a lot of data on single use scopes for this indication yet. And so um, the doctors themselves aren't educated to the point um, and the patients, I think, you can educate them on the uh, infection risk, but I would just caution not to be, uh, not to uh, describe this as all created equal, because I think that out of the gate, I've used single use scopes. I think that they're gonna perform and do the job, but they may not do it as well initially. Like I said, this is, this is a complex procedure that requires minute millimeter movements and, uh, and we don't know if other risks may go up because of that. And so it's a balance. And I think it's it's worth a discussion with the patients. We talk to patients about all of the risks of ERCP, including infection. Um, and uh, and and but I would just say I think the future is bright for single use. But but we can't say that they're all scopes right now are created equal. We just don't know that. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so Ryan, let me kind of transition here a little bit and say, if the providers don't quite understand everything about this conversation, perhaps they haven't used a single use device before, they've only used reusable devices, but if the physicians themselves don't understand, you can almost guarantee that the patients are not going to be aware of the, uh, of the conversation to Mark's point unless they've been around a facility that has had a substantial breakout or, you know, one of their loved ones has gone through one of those infections. Um, but I do want to throw out here, you know, it's worth asking this question, whose responsibility is it to educate patients? Is it their responsibility as patients to seek this information out? Is it the provider's responsibility, healthcare? Is it the government's responsibility? Like who's supposed to be uh, leading this conversation out there? Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll use my, my family as an example. I have a mom, she has Alzheimer's, uh, unfortunately. And, you know, you have to become your own advocate for your own medical care. And I took her to the Cleveland Clinic and we learned a lot um, just through that experience, um, but tons of research. And here's what happens. You know, you, you know, you know, you're getting a procedure, you go home, you Google it and what comes up. Right. And, you know, one of the first things that comes up when, when you Google duodenoscope infection is, you know, you've got the ambulance chasers out there, you know, that, that have their own websites that say, did you contract an infection after an ERCP uh, duodenoscope procedure? And, and so, you know, su super bugs that Mark mentioned, 
they're out there. Superbug lawsuits are out there. It's cost reusable scope manufacturers millions and millions of dollars. So um, all that's real. So to answer your question, um, I feel like it's it's on all of us to educate. Um, and Mark brought up an excellent point. Um, as physicians go through their training, they're always using new new medical devices every every year a new medical device comes out and they get better and better and better and better so maybe the first iteration of a single use scope is here and a reusable is here keep in mind they've been using the reusable since you know the last 20 30 years it's been the same scope so yeah. pretty soon that technology is going to catch up it's already caught up cost wise we can prove that it's cost effective but what we, where we're not at and where Mark made the point is that the data is not there on the performance side. And that's so without getting too far off the topic of patients, I think it's on us to educate patients. If you're going to educate them on the benefits of single use, you also need to be, educate them on, hey, here's what we don't know about it. So we're going to prevent all these things. And I know I can walk a stent up the duct just like my other scope. Um, but you, uh, Mr. Patient, you have altered anatomy and I haven't used it on altered anatomy before. So there's all variables to consider. So it's a it's a really exciting time to sort of bat this back and forth. And what Mark said is the, the iteration is what's exciting. So if there's something that a scope can't do, tell us. We'll go back to the drawing board, 3D print a prototype, you try it. Then we'll start injection molding, manufacturing these things, and boom, we're off to the races. There's no more waiting, you know, three, five, ten years for another generation of a scope. Medicine moves faster than that, and, and industry needs to keep up with it. So, a long, long-winded answer to a question, but we, it's on all of us to educate um, physicians, educate industry, and of course, the patient is most important. Right. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Mark, in terms of whose role it is, or? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, this is a, a really dynamic time, you know, uh, these single use scopes uh, have just been FDA approved for less than a year, you know, and so, and so this is a, uh, this is exciting time for everybody, people in industry, people, uh, the docs using them, you know, everybody, there's, uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions, but it's, but it's good, uh, but it's a good thing. It's a good um, process of, of learning what what's working what's not working iterating reiterating it it's injecting enthusiasm into a procedure that needs enthusiasm um and uh and ultimately the goal like like ryan saying is to try and just just help the patient at the end of the day and and if we can perform the procedure as well as we can uh, before they were available with zero infection risk i mean that's a win-win um and so and so I think that, um, you know, having huge campaigns to educate a patient during the Super Bowl isn't isn't smart before you have the data, you know. And so uh, and 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 so I wouldn't advocate for that. Uh, but I think that uh, this whole process should hopefully uh, lead to conversations with patients, even if it's even if it's a 10 second conversation. You know, that says, hey, uh, you know, maybe we're discussing infection a little bit more than we used to before this all came to light, you know, five or uh, seven years ago. Um, you, you know, I think that's a I think that's a pro. And um, and and, you know, it, it probably is not going to be a black and white um, solution. It's probably not going to tomorrow. Everybody moves to one scope or the other. It's probably going to be an an evolutionary process over many years, I think. Right. Um, I'll be a little bit selfish here and uh, talk about where Beyond Clean is in this conversation to the unique position that um, that companies and organizations like we have in educating the public because we've been talking about this. Like you said, Ryan, if you have a procedure, first thing you do, go to Google, like you go to social media and find out everything there is to know about that. Uh, but uh, who is out there having conversation? I know personally, I have scared myself and my entire family anytime any surgical procedure has to happen yeah. <laughs> because I know too much. I know all the ways, all the breakdowns, all the stats. I know the dangers and the risks, even that are not measured, the close cause. The, well, you know, that almost happened, but you had no idea because you were asleep. You know, you didn't know that they dropped. 
uh, to an item and you were under anesthesia for another 20 minutes while that item was processing. So all of those things, you know, come into play. And that's part of our mission to be on clean is to have these conversations out in the open in places that the public themselves, the patients themselves could interact and engage. We're live streaming right now, for goodness sake, through Facebook <laughs> of all places, right? And we're talking about single use medical devices in these very technical procedures. Uh, and I, I want to, I want to thank you again. We're not going to end. We've got a couple more questions here, but I just want to thank you all again as we're talking about this for bringing this conversation out into the public arena uh, in a manner that is understandable and uh, can help prompt people to further questioning and research. Um, before we wrap this up, though, I want to get to the cost question uh, because that is always, uh, you kind of alluded to it, Ryan, on. Um, if we can make these comparable in price according to the cost of the reusable devices, everything else. You know, but Mark, from your perspective as a provider in considering uh, this, how do you look at that cost equation? How should facilities, in your opinion, consider the impact on costs? What should all go into that basket as you're making those calculations? Yeah, I think that it's it's a complex uh, equation because you know a lot of a lot of the um, uh, modeling has been done by either doing all of one or all of the other, um, and and I don't think that's uh, you know I don't think that's the reality today, um, and so modeling is is very difficult. Um, wh what I will say is that I feel strongly that there are some patients. Um, that you know, single use is very, very appropriate even right now. Um, and so, the the question is um, how to bring that about to your you know to your uh, uh, folks within the hospital and, and to have that discussion. So, uh, just a few things about uh, a few things about costs. You know, there's um, usually within hospitals, there's completely separate negotiations to capital costs and to uh, kind of single use uh, costs. And so those, those can be a little bit complicated if, if you're trying to inject this single use cost and then you keep around your capital costs as well. But anyways, um, it's, it's, difficult for us right now at our institution to say whether it's going to be a money winner or a money loser um, uh, right now. It, you know, the models that we've been given by the manufacturers don't really apply it exactly to us, I would say. What I will say is that um, CMS has a pass-through code for single-use uh, duodena scopes, and, and so that means that that means that for Medicare and Medicaid patients, um, uh, you do institutions do get reimbursed for using a single-use uh, scope for this indication. Um, that only lasts for three years, and and they'll use that data to help, uh, hopefully, give a supplemental code down the road after those three years. Um, that doesn't that that code won't account likely for the whole cost of the single-use scope. But like Ryan said, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of things that go into the calculation, um, uh, but but most of those calculations assume that you get rid of your contract with your reusable thing, you 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 get rid of all of your reprocessing expenses, et cetera. And and I think that's not, I think that's the aspiration. I don't think that's the reality right now. And so I'll say it, they are difficult conversations, but I think as long as you pose it from a patient care perspective that, hey, there's patients right now that could benefit from this, even as we're, you know, assessing, you know, its its usability, plus that benefit of the pass-through code, which will significantly reduce the outlay for the next three years. I think that's, that's all things that we used in our discussions. Okay. Awesome. Great. Yeah, that's very helpful. Uh, do you have anything to add to that, Ryan? Well, we've got 16 minutes left, so I'll take 15 of them. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, so we it's it's four buckets of cost, right? So you have the initial cost of the capital, which is hefty. If you talk to any nurse manager, anyone in materials management at a hospital, the most money they spend 
is on their scopes, hands down. That is the most money they're going to spend is, is on their scopes. So you, you look at the cost of the capital, that, that's one bucket, right? And then the, the next one is repair and maintenance. How much are you going to spend on repair and maintenance of those devices? Because they break down frequently. The working channels get grooves in them. All kinds of stuff happens to these scopes. So you've got those first two buckets. Then you have labor. What's the cost of labor? Um, how much are you spending on chemicals? Um, and finally, what is the potential cost of infection? So like Mark said, you can't just simply take all four of those costs across the board and say, yep, that's what you're spending. And if you move to single use, this is what you'll be spending because it's not going to be, you know, a switch from one to the other overnight. But what you can do and what's going to happen is they're going to look and, and do economic studies and white papers and everything else on, you know, OK, we're using reusable for these patients. We're using single use for these. Where, where are our costs at? Or we know where our costs are at on these immunosuppressed patients now with reusable. What are our costs with single use? So we can start looking head to head at these things. But I mean, with single use, you eliminate the repair and replacement cost. You potentially eliminate infection in those patients. And hopefully you're eliminating some of that litigation and that, that economic uh, and legal risk. So again, it's, it's that teeter-totter, right? Um, does, does one outweigh the other? And that's gonna be institutionally different. It's gonna be different for Indiana University and Dr. Mark Gromsky, and they're, they're, they're pumping out almost 3,000 ERCPs, right, Mark, per year? I, that's a lot. That's probably tops in the country, maybe tops in the world. Um, and then you've got other rural hospitals that, that, you know, I speak with people like yourself, Hank. I know you were in Kentucky and, and working at some larger health systems, but you've worked at smaller. They're doing 200 ERCPs a year. So for them to go out and spend, you know, thirty to $60,000 on a scope and everything that goes along with it, does that make sense when they could get a low cost single use option? It's probably going to do what they needed to do because they're not doing what Dr. Mark Gromsky and in Indiana University Health is doing. So a lot of exciting things to talk about. I know I said I'd take up 15 of the next <laughs> minutes for only three minutes, um, but I could go all day. <laughs> you know, these, these costs, right? Because it doesn't make sense to keep investing in a flawed process. And and I'm, I'm taking that from Dr. Kenneth Ben Moeller. He did a a talk on YouTube that's gotten a lot of traction on single use. And it really struck me is why keep investing money in something that's not working? It doesn't mean you have to get rid of it altogether. Cause like Mark said, it, that's not the reality. You know, you need to be able to treat patients. You need to have all the tools at your disposal to treat patients. Uh, Cause patient care, patient safety is number one. But for that subset of patients, if single use makes more sense, it's more cost effective and you can do what you needed to do. Great. And then one day, Single use is going to move from here performance wise to here to here to here, and they're going to be even, and then it's going to be a non issue. So, so uh, with a little bit of our remaining time, I do want to talk about the environmental impact. Anytime you talk about single use devices, you know, this conversation happens. And I, I just last week I was on a conference call in, in the UK with. Uh, with a bunch of device manufacturers and, and talking uh, to folks from the NHS and in the UK, you know, their regulations around environmental impact, carbon uh, carbon footprint is is very strict and it's front and center priority um, in the UK. But in the US, you don't quite see that as systemic around the United States. Uh, I have a feeling that's more um, based on your region and your facility and your green um, plan or sustainability plan in your facility. But um, from, I guess, from your perspective, Ryan, how would you answer that um, concern of, hey, are we just adding more waste to the landfill without a uh, a balanced impact on the final quality of patient care if we can get it down to the low risk that Mark was talking about with existing solutions? Yeah, that's a great question, Hank, and it's something that's, that's coming up a lot, right? Because anytime you talk about a single-use device, the conversation automatically goes to, you know, okay, what are you going to do to our landfills? And, you know, you got to go back, again, 20, 25 years when, you know, reusable biopsy forceps were the gold standard. And then 
obviously now it's all single use biopsy forceps and these things are, are taken care of by companies like Sharps Compliance. I know that's who Ambu uh, works with. And you know, just one ton of waste can be diverted from landfills and turned into renewable energy. It's called a waste to energy program. So for example, um, you can avoid releasing one ton of CO2 equivalent greenhouse house gases. Um, you can generate enough electricity to power a house for a month off of a ton of this waste. Um, it reduces the need for roughly 40 gallons of fuel oil. Um, there, there's all these programs in place, waste to energy. So what we're finding out in industry is we're going and talking to places like Indiana University. They already have these waste to energy programs in place. They just need us to integrate with them. And we do. If they don't have them in place, we partner with a third party like a Sharps compliance, um, put the you know sustainability bin in there and then after the procedure, drop the single use device in the bin and then it gets picked up on a regular basis and turned into to an energy product. So um, I know that's a very rudimentary way of explaining how the process works, but essentially yeah. they sterilize or autoclave this equipment, they shred it down and then they turn it into energy. So Mark, from your perspective, when you were looking at these devices or even you know from providers that you know, is the environmental question that, is that a priority to making these decisions for most of the folks that um, that would be considering single use endoscopes? Yeah, so I'd say, um, first of all, that's the assumption. Uh, I, I say that we shouldn't assume that reprocessing is zero waste because, uh, because you know, all the chemicals and everything that and, and all the cleaning products mm -hmm. that you use to reprocess isn't zero waste either. Um, but uh, good point. But, but I think that um, you know our main issue is because we do so many ERCPs in storage. You know, we we a a stent or a uh, or a um, biopsy forceps comes in a little you know package, whereas a single use scope comes in a large package. And so, anytime you're in a metropolitan hospital space is really high value. Um, and so, you know, if if you need to have a hundred scopes on hand. Um, that may take up a, a significant part of a closet, so that's that's what that's one issue that can be worked out, and 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 you know it's it's not a huge issue, but but you know the the environmental impact we we look at, and clearly we wouldn't want these things to all just be thrown into the garbage. Um, uh, thankfully, uh, every single use scope manufacturer has a plan in place or plan options where you can. Um, go through and oftentimes we already have, like Ryan said we already have avenues within our system that are established and so you know it 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 just comes down to installing those uh, bins making sure you know things are working out and then you know if if things are being recycled um, they're usually recycled to non non medical um, you, you know uh, future uses whether it's you know into a different product or into energy like Ryan said um that that makes us feel uh that makes us feel okay with it i i would say um but but you know if if you're running high level disinfection uh twice uh, on a scope you're going to have a lot of excess uh runoff from that as well um mm -hmm. and 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 so i think that um so in my mind it's not as big of a uh as big of a deal as long as there's an option on the end which are in place right now. Yeah, I actually had never considered the waste involved in reprocessable devices in this context, right? So you do have PPE, you've got all, not only the chemicals, but the chemical containers, you've got all of the testing and monitoring tools. Like there is a lot that goes into every reprocessed scope that ends up in the trash, so that's a great point. Well, um, the chemicals end up in the wastewater, right? So Mark is absolutely right. right that, you know, what's the lesser of the two evils? And if you can take a product and turn it into energy uh, and avoid filling the landfill, why wouldn't that be something you consider versus the status quo? And even minimizing it, right? So again, it's not gonna completely take over, but even minimizing that is a win. Right. Well, guys, we have gotten uh, to the end of our time, and like we promised at the beginning, we did not get uh, to all the topics that we had hoped to get. 
on this interview, but that means that we've got a great excuse to do this again sometime soon. I want to thank you both for giving up your morning to join us and to join folks not only around the United States, but around the globe who tune in for this content. If you're watching this on demand afterwards and you love the content, as I said at the beginning, please like our pages. If you're watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, and I'm going to get the link to Mark's article that he said he just published after the show and put that in the comment section so folks can read that as well. And if you're on LinkedIn and you want to follow either one of these guys, you can look them up it's real easy. Their names at the bottom of the screen there on LinkedIn. Follow them. Reach out with any other questions or comments that you have. Thank them for coming on the show. And finally, I want to encourage you to talk about these kinds of topics with your friends and families. The, the best thing that we've heard a lot about voting and electorate and being educated about the topics and politics here recently, but it's just as important, if not more so, depending on who you are, to be educated about topics in healthcare, because all of us one day will end up in a hospital setting for one reason or another, either us or our loved ones receiving care. And to Ryan's point earlier, we really want to be educated advocates in those situations. So please continue to have these conversations. Thank you for joining in on this conversation this morning. And Ryan and Mark, thank you all so much for being a terrific panelists today. And we hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it, Hank. Thanks.